Okay, well, thank you. It's real. <laughs> Thanks. It's really a, pl a pleasure to be back. And uh, one of the first things I did, and I, I, is I took a look, you know, who's gotten this award before? And uh, I, I put in red there the uh, people who had gotten an award um, who, who had gotten their PhD here at Purdue. And then uh, three people are underlined. Here's the IQ question, you know, what do those three people have in common? And uh, some, well, there's at least one person in this room who should know the answer to that question. <laughs> He's sitting right there in the front row. Uh, and that's my husband. My husband was the uh, thesis advisor for three of those students. And uh, so I thought that was pretty incredible, you know, that it's really a, a tribute to him as much as to the students that um, they have gone on to be so successful. Now, you know, th now there would be a fourth, uh, namely me. In fact, the reason I, when I went to Purdue was because of Peter and Sam Conte. And uh, Peter started out as my original advisor, and I don't know what happened, but maybe he just felt like he had too many students or, or uh, couldn't handle me, so he decided to propose instead. <laughs> and uh, then Herb became my advisor. Okay, so my, uh, my career has kind of fallen into uh, four, four major chunks, uh, the Purdue period until 83, and then uh, the first trip to California for eight years, and then uh, Georgetown for 11 years, and then now at the Naval Postgraduate School. And uh, so uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things I've done sort of in those uh, chunks. And so the, uh, the Purdue chunk, uh, my thesis was on information flow. And uh, one of the things that came out of that, out of, out of the thesis, and in the thesis was uh, what was called the lattice model of information flow. And uh, here, I, I mean, I thought I had actually invented lattices. And I wasn't calling them lattices, but I had proved all these theorems, and it was just really cool. And uh, one day I walk into Peter's office to uh, show him all these great things that I had done. And he's, he looks at it and says, oh, that's just the lattice. And uh, fortunately, uh, Garrett Burkhoff was on leave here at Purdue at the time. And uh, he was, of course, the real mathematician who uh, brought lattice theory into being. And so I had a lot of very good and useful and helpful conversations with him. But the nice thing about inventing or reinventing something is that you really get it. And so a few years later, when I was working on uh, statistical database security, lattices just kind of leapt out and ended up providing uh, a framework for unifying all that. And um, the, the bad news was is that that didn't get into my book, because my book on uh, cryptography and data security uh, came out before I, before I, had, uh, before I saw this. OK, another paper that came out of my thesis, and uh, this one was written while Peter and I were spending the summer at uh, the University of Cambridge. And uh, so there wasn't a lot else to do, so I decided to write this, write a paper, uh, another paper from my thesis. And, uh, and Peter was there, and he, he uh, contributed a lot to the, uh, uh, the writing of the paper. In fact, you know, it really is through Peter that I really learned to write, because uh, Peter, Peter had a, uh, it was, Peter, Peter was very helpful and constructive uh, with his students, and so if you gave him something and asked for comments, uh, you not only got a few comments, but you got a lot of suggestions for how to write it better. And uh, so I, I really do uh, owe Peter a lot of what I've learned from writing. But anyway, um, so this paper, which came out in 1977, lo and behold, just a year ago, uh, somebody contacted us at NPS. He was coming to visit NPS, and he wanted to talk to uh, Peter and I because he said, you know, I implemented what was in that paper. And, uh, and uh, you know, and I had no idea that this thing, Spark, even existed uh, at the time. And uh, so they had, he said that, you know, he had read, read the paper and that that was what had influenced them to put information flow uh, controls into that. So I did a little research to find out what Spark was and, uh, you know, found out, you know, it's, it's even on Wikipedia. And uh, you know, there's books out on it, so uh, so that really pleased me. And over the years since I, you know, had done that thesis work, occasionally I would hear from a graduate student um, that they had implemented it or some other faculty member. But uh, I, you know, it's, it was really neat just to hear that it actually gone into a a product. Okay, so another area I worked on was cryptography, and uh, some of you may not know I had long hair and one in. Uh, when I first came to Purdue. 
in one of the uh, papers that I uh, wrote at Purdue on cryptography, this was jointly written with, with Fred Schneider at Cornell University, and uh, Fred and I cooked this up, I think, at a uh, SIGOP symposium one year. And uh, it was uh, basically on key distribution in the context of uh, groups and where you might uh, want to be able to share a key among uh, various people. And we wrote several papers on this, and this is one of the ones that came out. Well, uh, you know, I, I never really thought too much about this paper until, uh, until 20 years later. And this is the result of that paper. You know, it's me sitting in a uh, club in London with a bunch of lawyers. So, <laughs> you know, how could a paper I wrote with Fred Schneider in 1980 lead to, lead to this? Well, it turned out that that paper was a key piece of uh, evidence in patent litigation cases. And uh, I got started getting contacted by the uh, patent lawyers a couple years before that. And I worked on, I think it was maybe four cases, all of, all of which involved that paper. And uh, they were in the context of TV, okay, uh, satellite TV distribution, and uh, how you distribute the keys out to the set-top boxes. And they were basically doing, uh, you know, those of you who know, Needham Schroeder kind of stuff, okay, obvious sort of stuff. Uh, today and the uh, the patent uh, was uh, and so there was this patent that somebody had gotten that was basically for doing Needham Schroeder kind of stuff and uh, you know I mean you kind of look at that and say you know that was everybody knew about that you know that's in the public domain and uh, but the key thing about the paper with Fred Schneider is that we had used the word broadcast in the paper Okay, and so since this was the TV, context of TV, it, it turned out that was just the, you know, the critical thing that we were broadcasting some keys out. And uh, anyway, it was, it was fun, and, uh, and all the cases had a uh, good, good um, they all resolved in our favor. So um, anyway, so yeah, I mean, you never know what's going to happen to your, your papers. I'm not sure anybody, you know, really... Uh, built a system based on that, but it sure made a difference in the, uh, the patent cases. Another thing I, I worked on, this was with a student at uh, Purdue. This is, you know, this was, you know, I was teaching, I, maybe it was the first time I was teaching a security class here at Purdue. And one of the students, Jimvan and Sacco, he uh, found a flaw in the Needham Schroeder protocol. And, uh, and I took a look at it and I said, yeah, you're right, but, you know, I think we could fix it with some timestamps. And uh, so we uh, wrote this paper together, and it got published. And you know, in fact, you know, the subsequent, the imp most systems that implemented uh, Needham Schroeder ended up using some kind of uh, timestamp or something to solve the problem. That it was a replay play problem that came up without it. Okay, one of the f most fun days I had at Purdue was when George Devita called me up and said he had cracked RSA. Okay, so he cracked public key cryptography. And uh, of course, after you looked at it, you, just, you, you found out he hadn't really cracked, cracked the math. But what he had found was, was that in the way the, um, um, the crypto was being described and often advocated the way you use it, is that a flaw which would allow you to uh, be able to uh, end up getting plain text. You couldn't actually break the keys, but you could end up getting plain text. And uh, so that was kind of neat. And the systems today aren't vulnerable to that because they, they hash the uh, message before they do the crypto. And so you don't have that problem. But uh, if you didn't hash before you did the crypto, it was a problem. So, um, so, so, uh, so George had that result. And, uh, and, and I wrote, the pa wrote this paper. Uh, and I talked about George's result and then also what you could do to um, uh, avoid the problem by hashing and other things. And I think Donald Davis had actually suggested the hashing stuff even earlier, so it wasn't, wasn't an original idea for me. Uh, but something else that came out of that paper that, uh, that, was, that was fun was a generalization of the attack that was used to uh, attack RSA. And this particular attack also uh, it, this, is a, this is a generalization of not only the attack on RSA, but also the tracker attack that uh, I worked on also. 
And uh, it was a very simple thing. I ended up calling it the many time pad because so it's sort of like, you know, one time pad is a crypto thing that you can only use once because you lose all your security if you use it more than once. If you just use it once, you know, you've got perfect security. You use it twice, you've got no security. Um, but anyway, the, the idea with the many time pad is that you could use it over and over again. And uh, so you, what you, the idea is you'd have this pad and then you'd request, you, you would be able to get some function of the pad. Okay, and the system would give that back to you. In the RSA, it was the, what, the function was getting uh, the person to sign it. So you'd get them to sign the pad. And, uh, and then you, uh, what you really want to do is get the function of x. And uh, so what you do is you pad x, you know, with this pad p, and then you get that result. And then, uh, you, and then you uh, can factor out the pad, and then you end up with the result of f of x. And that was what George's DeVita's attack was basically about. But that was also the um, tracker attack that um, uh, Peter and I and, and Mayor Schwartz, Mayor Schwartz was another uh, graduate student here at Purdue. He's another one of Peter's graduate students. And uh, so that, uh, that many time pad was a, um, a generalization of that tracker result. Okay, uh, about, along about that time was uh, when Sam Conte retired and this was October 1979. And uh, you'll see that uh, Peter became uh, head here of, uh, of uh, computer science at that time. And, uh, and this all uh, was in SQL. Now if you flip this issue of SQL over, you got me. <laughs> and uh, whoever was interviewing me got you know, all kind of excited about this tracker stuff. And, uh, and uh, so he picked up on the fact that I was a runner. And uh, I think the photo was taken out on uh, maybe Northwestern, running down the hill of Northwestern with a caption on the track of information thieves. Now you're beginning to see where the title for this talk came from. Okay, now there were many times in my career when I actually tried to get out of security. I had, uh, have always had a love-hate relationship with it. Um, intellectually, I found it very stimulating. Um, there are, there's obviously an important need for it. But I, on the other hand, I, I, at some you know, just gut level, I hate security. You know, I hate locking my house, I hate locking the car, I hate security alarm systems, even though we have one. So all that stuff. So there were many times when I tried to do something else. And uh, this was one of my attempts. Uh, this was my, what I called program understanding tool. And uh, so I was trying to find a way to visualize the ex execution of programs. And of course, this is back, back in the days when all you had was a CRT screen. You didn't have windows or anything like that to, to work with. And uh, so that was my attempt. And, and I, I made a half-hearted attempt to get some funding for it. And, and I failed uh, to get the funding. On the other hand, I could get funding to do security work. So I went back to doing security work. <laughs> and, uh, but several years later, when I was at SRI, um, I, I tried again and I ended up, uh, and I, I kind of liked you know, doing uh, user interfaces and that sort of thing. And so I actually wrote a little Windows uh, system and uh, it was maybe a, a year or two before uh, Microsoft came out with Windows. And that was kind of nifty, but you know, it was nothing compared with what they came out with, so it had a short lifetime. Okay, uh, things were also not all work at Purdue. And uh, we used to, Peter and I used to like to have parties from time to time. And uh, when Doug Hofstetter, who's over here on the right, uh, earned his um, Pulitzer Prize for uh, his book, Gertel Escher Bach, we had a, um, a party for him. It was all on the theme of his book. And, uh, and Doug, uh, so, uh, so Doug's got a lot of Escher prints in his book. And Doug, and, and we, meet, we, we had uh, become friends with Doug be before this. Uh, but anyway, Doc had gotten the fabric, the birds and fish, fish fabric, and asked me to make him a shirt. I used to do a lot of sewing then. And uh, so I made him a shirt, I made myself a skirt, and then I made this cake that's got the, uh, uh, the same pattern on it. The birds and the fish are made with uh, chocolate, and the, uh, the filling on inside was uh, nuts, ground up nuts. And then all that was sitting on top of just uh, probably whipped cream or something, and then there's a cake under it. Anyway, but Peter had uh, an article in the issue of Computer magazine that came out that same month 
that had that same print on it. So it was such a coincidence. Um, and uh, you can see Peter had a, beard, uh, had a mustache back in those days. So it, while we were at Purdue the whole time, he had a, had a mustache. OK. Uh, well, one of the things that Doc Hostetter really inspired me to write a book. I mean, his book, Girdle Usher Bach, had just really made a mark on me. And uh, so and that was when I, uh, so I, because of him and partly, I, I started writing my book, Cryptography and Data Security. And so that came out uh, in 1982, I guess. And I had a lot of fun with that. And the, uh, and the cover, you know, for those of you who haven't maybe seen it, you know, I took my name and uh, used it to make a Caesar cipher of the, uh, of the uh, title of the book. So that was kind of fun. And there was a little puzzle in the book, too. And over the years, maybe uh, half a dozen people or so have contacted me saying that they solved the puzzle in my book. And I just learned about a week ago that that book actually made the ACM's top 25. So um, it's out of print now, but what that means is that these were all out of print books, and they, they had a little competition on the ACM website. And uh, so that means that they're going to put it in the digital library. So you'll, you'll be able to get it again. <laughs> OK. So, uh, so the first uh, trip to California, I was four years at SRI International and then four years at, at digital. And, uh, the, there were two things I worked on at SRI predominantly. This is after my little Windows programming um, thing. They told me I really should do security work. And uh, so the first project was on intrusion detection. And this was work that was funded by the Navy. And um, I worked on this with uh, Peter Neumann and Carl Levitt and some other folks. And that led to uh, paper intrusion detection model. And uh, the uh, other, th oh, well, oh yeah, one of the other things that happened there was that I actually started getting pretty concerned about the implication of intrusion detection. And we were looking at it in that context mostly of, of watching user behavior. So what files are people accessing and what software are they running and so on. So we started getting pretty concerned about the, uh, the social implications, the privacy implications, and what that would do to the work environment. So. Uh, Peter and Don Parker and I wrote a little paper that got published on that aspect of it. Okay, uh, the other project I worked on was the Seaview security model. And uh, there, the, in that, that was done, uh, uh, we collaborated with uh, Roger Shell and some people at Gemini Computers down in uh, the, the address there says Carmel, but they're actually in Monterey. And uh, we used to, uh, Teresa Lunt at SRI used, worked on that with me. And we would drive down to Monterey for these one-day project meetings, or two-day project meetings sometimes. And we always had our lunch on the coast. This was sort of like my rule, is that we were always going to leave the office and go have lunch on the Monterey coast. And then, uh, so, and, and then uh, we would stay, when we stayed over, we'd stay in the Seaview Inn. So, so the, uh, that's how this project got named, was the view at the coast and the inn where we stayed. But anyway, that, uh, that work um, that, that work got, got me very concerned about the implications of trying to build systems that did multi-level security to handle classified information at all different classification levels and so on. Because what we ended up with, to me, was a little bit of a, a nightmare in terms of the usability issues. And uh, so between that, and uh, between that and my concerns about intrusion detection, uh, that kind of led me again to try to get away from security. And so I went over to DEC, and, uh, and I was actually doing some uh, software development uh, work at DEC and, uh, on the mail system. And that was, that was kind of a lot of fun. But shortly uh, afterwards, I got contacted by a uh, hacker, one of the hackers in um, the Legion of Doom. And uh, the Legion of Doom was the uh, most prestigious hacking group at the time. So he, uh, he, uh, he, he uh, had a uh, little magazine that he called Worm. And uh, he wanted to interview me for that magazine. 
Uh, he had read my book and read about trackers, and he had actually written an article about trackers in uh, an earlier issue of his magazine. And uh, so he wanted to interview me. And uh, so I said, okay. And so I uh, let him interview me. I actually got very interested in him uh, in the process of that interview. And, uh, and then after he interviewed me, the, the guy that does 2600, the Hackers Quarterly, wanted to interview me. And so I ended up getting interviewed for that magazine, too. And uh, the, 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 out of the process of all that, I got more and more interested in them. And so I started interviewing them. And uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun. And uh, as a result of all that, I wrote a paper on hackers that I presented at the uh, uh, National Computer Security Conference. And it was just, uh, you, know, you know, I interviewed, I don't know, maybe a, do a dozen or 20 these guys. In fact, I still remember uh, Peter and I, uh, we, were, we were passing through uh, Denver. Maybe we were going to Colorado Springs or uh, Boulder. And anyway, there was and one of the hackers I've been interviewing lived in Denver, so I thought, well, let's stop and meet this guy. And uh, it was quite an experience. He was living in a garage. And, uh, you know, all I had was, you know, some books and things like that and some you know, really old, cruddy computing equipment and, uh, you know, maybe a bed. You know, it was actually probably not really a bed. It was probably maybe more like a mattress or a cot or something. And that was it. And he was all beaten up. And uh, it was, uh, it was, like I said, it was quite an experience. And uh, so anyway, so uh, that paper, uh, you know, it was, got accepted and it was presented at the conference. And then I also had a panel uh, with some of these characters. And so on the left there, that was uh, Frank Drake, who uh, was the editor of Worm. He was the one that interviewed me first. And then the guy in the red shirt is uh, uh, Eric Corley. He actually goes by Emanuel Goldstein. After, uh, and he was the guy that, um, uh, he's the guy that does 2600, interviewed me for 2600. So I brought these guys to the conference. And the other guy uh, with a striped shirt, that's Craig Nydorf, and uh, so after I wrote this paper, uh, and before the conference, I got contacted by Craig and then his lawyer, who wanted to know if I would help with his defense. And uh, he was uh, charged with publishing something in his magazine called Frack, and uh, he was charged with publishing a document that uh, was uh, put out by Bell South, and. Um, I don't remember what all the charges were, but there were like 13 charges against him for publishing this document. And so, uh, so they asked if I would help with the defense. And in the meantime, some people had, his case had been around for a while, and so we all knew about his case. And some other folks had showed that everything that he had published actually was in the public domain. So I said, okay, um, I'll help. And uh, I did. And that led to, uh, well, he, he, uh, the government actually dropped the case, dropped, dropped the charge. Well, they, actually, well, they started the trial. The trial took place in Chicago, and uh, it went on for a week, and then the government dropped the charges before, it, uh, before I had to testify and before it went to jury or anything. So the government decided they didn't have a case either. And uh, so, um, so I ended up uh, writing uh, this piece. Uh, which turned into a debate in communications of the ACM, uh, not about his particular case, but about just the issue of, you know, what can you publish, um, you know, what, what should free speech look like on the Internet and stuff. And uh, so there was a whole bunch of other people that wrote comments, and that was kind of fun. Okay, and, uh, so, and I started getting some publicity. This, I was actually on the cover of Microtimes uh, magazine, as a result of that, and uh, interviewed by John Perry Barlow, if any of you know who he is. Okay, and then uh, we uh, started a conference. So I was on the, uh, on the uh, organizing committee for the first conference on computers, freedom, and privacy, and then on the committee for the first several conferences. And uh, so what we tried to do was we tried to really bring people together from law enforcement and the uh, civil liberties communities and 
you know, a bunch of other people that were interested, lawyers and so on. And uh, I, I chaired a panel that had on it mostly um, law enforcement officials. And then also got Al Bays, who was the uh, assistant director at the FBI at the time, to come and give the keynote talk at the conference. And uh, that was the first time I met Al, but I had actually known about him uh, before because he got really interested in the intrusion detection work that we were doing at SRI. And his office at the FBI ended up uh, funding some of that work after I left. Okay, so I went to Georgetown. And uh, the, the pictures here, uh, so this is from somebody's note card. And uh, this was actually the view I had of Georgetown when I walked to work every day because I walked over a bridge and that's what you saw. Oh, it didn't look, the colors weren't like that, uh, you know, in uh, January. And then uh, the other pictures are ones I took outside the Georgetown gate. The whole Georgetown campus was uh, very pretty, but these two pictures were actually taken of the same shot, but at just at different times of the year. And uh, that was the gang at Georgetown when I left. We were a very small department. There were only five of us when I started. Uh, and there's a couple of Purdue people here. Uh, Mahe Vela Utapia was a uh, student at Purdue. And then uh, Clay Shields in the center there was on the faculty here at Purdue for a few years before we stole them from you. Okay. Um, so, um, so it's out of that uh, work that I had done, you know, studying the hackers and then the Computers Freedom and Privacy Conference, I was asked by the uh, National Academy to, to chair, a, uh, chair a, uh, a working group to look at rights and responsibilities of people in network communities. And so uh, we did that, and that was a lot of fun. And that was when I first met Steve Case, because Steve Case, um, you know, America Online was pretty small at the time. And uh, so Steve came and actually participated in this thing, and it was, uh, it was uh, great working with him. Okay, another thing uh, that happened uh, was um, I, I wrote an article that turned into another debate in communications with the ACM. And this was on the topic of whether or not the FBI should have the, be a lot, should have the capability to be able to continue doing wiretaps. And, um, uh, the issue was not the encryption so much as just the fact that the technology was changing, I was going digital, and their traditional means of doing wiretaps were not, um, you, uh, you know, didn't work anymore. Okay, and so they needed uh, some new technology and, and other kinds of things. And uh, I got pulled into this because I remember Al Bays. Al Bays was a, the assistant director at the FBI. But when I first came to Georgetown, um, I, you know, I'd worked on this Craig Nydorf case. Well, that case was uh, tried in Chicago. And the judge in that case was in charge of the Inslaw investigation. Now, most of you probably never heard of the Inslaw investigation. You don't need to know. But there were a lot of allegations in that about the CIA and the FBI. And uh, so the judge said, you know, this woman is definitely doesn't sound, you know, is going to be critical, is going to really good at look critically at what the government's doing here. So he hired me to investigate the FBI. Okay, most people don't know this. So, um, so I go over to the FBI, and, and the, the particular thing I was to look at was whether or not they had ripped off Inslaw's software. And uh, it didn't take me long to realize they had not ripped off Inslaw's, Inslaw's software, among other things. And there were all these other allegations. Other people were looking at them. And they were just, all these allegations were bogus. I mean, it was, and it was really remarkable to me how um, this company had gotten so much publicity and had gotten the government to spend millions of dollars on these really futile investigations of the FBI and CIA. But anyway, uh, Al Bays was, so he was still the assistant director. So I was working a little bit with Al Bays when I was doing that. And then uh, Al Bays asked me when all that was over if I would consult for the FBI. So I went from, you know, um, defending hackers to investigating the FBI to suddenly becoming an advisor to the FBI. <laughs> all in the space of a couple of years. And uh, 
And uh, so when the issue of whether the FBI should be able to do wiretaps, I spent a lot of time over at the FBI interviewing them uh, about what kind of capability they needed and so on. So that led to, uh, to this. And uh, I took a uh, position generally supportive of the government being able to do wiretaps, which is not a very popular position with most academics or, uh, you know, probably maybe even the average citizen. And uh, so after, uh, after that, um, so while I was consulting for the FBI, the uh, FBI and the NSA came up with this thing, the clipper chip, which uh, addressed the cryptography side of the problem. And uh, so I got um, brought into that, and I wrote a bunch of articles on it. And uh, you know, the basic idea was that you, you'd have a couple of bad guys here talking on the phone, and uh, they would be using a technology that had a special chip in it, and the chip would allow the uh, FBI to do their wiretap, okay, and uh, basically get access to the plain text. And the, uh, the uh, encryption was done with an algorithm called Skipjack, which was classified. This was an NSA-developed algorithm. So it's classified encryption algorithm. And then what they did was when they made these chips, uh, they, the, the chip had a uh, key in it. Each chip had its own key in it. And they uh, would split this key up. And uh, the Treasury Department got half the key, and uh, NIST got the other half of the key. And then, so if the FBI is doing a wiretap, they have to be able to get those key components, put them together, and then, uh, and then decrypt the communications. So they have to do it on a per key basis. And uh, so they'd have to go to the court, you know, if their court order has to say, we need the key for this particular chip. And, uh, and then they get it and do the wiretap. And, you know, people, a lot of people didn't like this idea that the government could, uh, eavesdrop on their communications. And what they didn't know is it was really, really hard to get this thing to work. Um, the, uh, the, the, it took several trials before it worked. And I, I still remember the first time I was, uh, I was going as an observer. And so they were simulating the whole thing. And uh, so I, I uh, went with the Treasury guys. And uh, so the way it works is they first, you know, they get a phone call or maybe some written documents or something saying they need to get the key. And uh, so the Treasury Department goes into their safe to, uh, to get a disk that's got their keys on it. Okay, and so the, and they get the disk and then they go and then they have to get a special computer to use to, to, to make sure the computer's clean. Okay, and, uh, and then, uh, but the, uh, the disk reader didn't work on the computer. Okay, so you couldn't get the keys. So what they had to do was they had to go get another computer. They had to totally clean the computer, and this took quite a while. And then, uh, then they could get their keys. So they get their keys, and, uh, and so in the meantime, there's folks up at NIST that are, you know, trying to go through the same exercise, except they have even more trouble because they can't get into their safe. <laughs> Safe's got one of those electronic locks, and the, uh, I don't know, the, the chip had a malfunction or something, so they couldn't get in their safe. But, uh, you know, in the true government fashion, there was a backup safe, and they, so they finally got in their backup safe, and they got their disks, and they got all their keys, and then, uh, so now, you know, it's rush hour, and everybody's driving down to Quantico to meet up uh, to uh, uh, try this part out. And we get there, and, you know, we put our disk in, and they get the keys out, and this puts their disk in, and there's nothing on it. Because, <laughs> uh, you know, they, they uh, didn't write to the floppy disk. Whatever they pulled off, they wrote to the hard drive. <laughs> they didn't have the hard drive with them. So, so that ended the first, uh, the first time. And the second time, something else went wrong. The, the, uh, the chip that, the, uh, there, there's a, the skipjack chip that was in the FBI's computer didn't match the one that uh, was in the uh, phones. Okay, so it didn't work. But they, they did finally get it to work. But it, it, was, uh, it was quite a challenge. Okay. Uh, well, the, uh, I mentioned that the algorithm in there was classified. The skipjack algorithm was classified. And so, uh, you know, on top of the fact that you've got the government eavesdropping on you, you know, you've got them using an algorithm that hasn't been vetted by the public. 
And uh, so that's bad. So they put together this team of people to vet the algorithm. So I was on the team, and it was really a good team. Um, uh, this is Walter Tuckman, the guy who uh, designed the data encryption standard, and uh, Steve Kent, some of you might know him, uh, and um, um, David Mayer, and Ernie Burkell, where is he? Oh, somehow he's, oh, there he is, Ernie Burkell and me. And we were the team. The other folks here were uh, NIST people, Miles Smith and Dennis Branstad, and a couple of NSA people. So we looked at the algorithm. We thought it seemed okay. I spent uh, several weeks at NSA and actually came away, you know, came away with the conclusion that, hey, this would be a fun place to work. It was uh, very, very intellectually stimulating, but still kind of laid back. And uh, so it, you, it was just uh, a wonderful uh, environment to be in. Um, and I tell you this because when I wrote my book, Cryptography and Data Security, there was a big issue at the time about whether or not NSA should be reviewing papers in cryptography. In fact, Peter was involved in some of that. There was, uh, NSA wanted to start reviewing papers in cryptography and academics didn't like that at all. And uh, so it, ne it never, uh, never really went anywhere. But when I wrote my book, Cryptography and Data Security, I, I wondered, you know, should I vet this through NSA? Nah, wouldn't do that. And I didn't. And, uh, you know, I, I, was, I, was, I was afraid. You know, there's there some fear component that either they would take stuff out of my book I wanted in my book, or they would, um, you know, take a long time and the publication would get delayed by years or whatever. So uh, I wouldn't have anything to do with NSA back in those days. And, you know, here I am spending weeks there and actually having a good time. Life changes. Okay. And uh, Dennis Branstad at NIST and I, uh, there was uh, a lot of interest in trying to come up with an alternative to Clipper that would still let uh, the government um, get access when they needed to. And uh, Dennis Brand said, and I did a whole taxonomy that got published in the communications of the ACM. Well, uh, some people kind of demonized me. <laughs> so this was Wired Magazine. Uh, Steve Levy uh, actually you know, did a very nice, uh, a, a fairly nice, um, interview and article on me, although he was trying to psych me out. You know, he's, you know it was like, there's got to be something psychological going on with this woman. How, how, you know, how could she go from defending hackers to, uh, uh, you know, defending this clipper chip stuff? So, and I, I can't remember what his theories were, but he had some theory. <laughs> and I made the cover of uh, the very first issue of Internet Security Review. That was the premier issue. And, uh, and I had an article in there on the future of cryptography. And that was also the last issue. That, that, that <laughs> <laughs> um, I wrote my first op-ed. So uh, David uh, Kahn, some of you might know him, he, uh, he wrote the um, really wonderful book, The Code Breakers, and has written a lot of other uh, monumental books on cryptography, but he uh, was a uh, editor at Newsday, and so they a he asked me if I would write something on the clipper chip, and, and David was one of the uh, few people outside the government who also was a supporter of, of this thing, so I wasn't quite alone, although there were many times I felt like I was alone. Okay, um, so and then, uh, well, in the meantime, Al Bayes at the FBI had retired, and uh, Bill Baugh had taken over his job. So I had been advising him uh, after, after Al retired. And then uh, and Bill and I uh, got asked by the um, um, National, what's the name, National Strategy Information Center, yeah, the U.S. Working Group on Organized Crime. I was actually a member of the U.S. Working Group on Organized Crime. It's an amazing computer scientist at Purdue, a member of the Working Group on Organized Crime. And uh, so anyway, they asked us if we'd, if we'd write something on uh, this issue of encryption and law enforcement and so on. So we did this and uh, started looking at a lot of case studies and, and so on. Okay, and I was also asked to uh, testify before Congress, so I did a bunch of that. And, uh, so most of it was on, uh, you know, the clipper chip and encryption policy. 
And then, you know, that somebody finds out, you know, in one of these congressional offices that you know something about cryptography. So they ask you, you know, to testify an encryption in this GPS system, okay, the, the, the uh, FAA's Wide Area Augmentation System. So that was all about GPS. I didn't, didn't know anything about GPS, but I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I did a three-week crash course, because they don't give you a lot of time on these things, and uh, found out about GPS and uh, did that. And I also, at some point, got asked to testify on cyber terrorism. That's in there somewhere. So, uh, so you know, I did that. So this guy calls me up from Boulder, Colorado. And uh, he, he had actually, uh, and so he was looking for somebody that knew something about cryptography and GPS. Uh, because he, had, he had, it was inventing uh, a method of doing location-based authentication. So he had run into my name from that. Um, testimony. So he uh, hired me as a consultant, so I did some consulting for him. And, uh, and what do you know, I actually have a patent. And uh, so I got named on the uh, patent that they filed. Uh, so I, you know, I really didn't, my contribution was pretty minor. But um, it, it was uh, ne nevertheless you know, kind of neat to get that patent. OK, so, uh, so then, have, have, having done that, so, you know, one thing leads to another is that the next thing I know is I get a phone call from Barry Glick. Barry Glick was the uh, founder and CEO of MapQuest. And uh, so he calls me, wants to know if he can have lunch with me over at Georgetown. So, sure. <laughs> and uh, so we have lunch, and he wanted me to work with uh, them on doing not location-based authentication, but location-based encryption. So they had some concept for how to do that. The only problem was it was not very secure. It wasn't secure at all. And uh, so I told them that. So they, uh, so they brought me in as a partner to uh, figure out how to make it secure. And uh, so we, we've written a, a few papers on that. And uh, when I got interviewed for time, um, that was one of the things that they picked up on was the, uh, they got really intrigued by this geo-encryption stuff. So that got uh, mentioned in the article. And uh, in the background there, that's, that's this, sort of the same view of Georgetown that you saw. They thought it'd be cool to take my picture on the, on the key bridge. So they did. And uh, so, what, so Barry Glick was one of my, is one of my partners. Uh, we, so we have this little company. And uh, one of my other partners is uh, Mark Seiler. And, uh, and Mark, uh, Mark and I were scheduled to have lunch on 9-11. Uh, on and, uh, and, so, and we did have lunch on 9-11. But Mark told me that if I had canceled lunch, he would have been on one of those planes. And uh, so he was uh, very grateful to me that, that day when we had lunch. <laughs> and his, uh, Mark was, uh, Mark Seiler uh, lives in Hollywood, and he, he used to be uh, CEO of RKO Pictures. And uh, his uh, significant other is uh, Morgan Fairchild. And uh, so Morgan was very grateful to me, too, and wanted to meet me. And uh, so I was in Los Angeles once and uh, had dinner with, with her. And uh, she was every bit as beautiful as uh, had shown, on, shown up on screen. So it was, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. OK, um, Suzanne mentioned that I got the National Computer, uh, Computer Systems Security Award. And uh, I just thought you might like to know that when, when I gave my speech, as I mentioned Purdue, uh, the story begins at, at Purdue. And the story did begin at Purdue. And some of the things that I had uh, learned over the years, um, mostly things I had learned either at Purdue or at SRI, uh, more so than uh, recently, but also things I had learned working for DEC. When I was working for DEC, DEC actually built this super secure operating system, uh, it, it, and uh, it was ready to ship, and they canceled it after spending $10 million, roughly. I mean, it's millions of dollars on it. And they had taken it through the whole evaluation process. They'd gotten the highest level of evaluation, A1, for those of you that know what that is. And uh, then they canceled it before they shipped it. They, why, do, why do you suppose they canceled, canceled it? Because they didn't think they'd sell enough to make it a viable business. And you know, once you ship one, what do you have to do? Support. And uh, they, did, they did, just didn't 
think uh, that they would get enough money to be able to pay for the support. So, um, uh, so that was uh, this point here. But you know, just some of the other points. That one, one of the things I really realized is that you know we build these models of security and we prove all these great points about it. The hackers hack outside the box. Okay, they're not hacking in, within your model. And, and that was one of the things I learned when I started interviewing them and spending more time trying to figure out, you know, what do these guys really do? And uh, a lot of what they do is, is not aligned with the security things that, that we design. Okay, um, let's see, another thing I did at Georgetown was I taught a course in information warfare and security. And uh, it was sort of like at Purdue, it was teaching that led to my book at Purdue and it was teaching that led to this book at um, Georgetown. And, uh, and I got asked by the Nautilus Institute, of all places, to uh, write something on activism, hacktivism, and cyber terrorism. I thought, oh, that sounds like fun. And uh, so they, uh, uh, they commissioned me to, to write, write a paper, and so I wrote a little paper on that. And uh, then I also participated in a conference in Germany on cyber arms control. And that was really interesting. And it was almost uh, 90, I'd say about 90% or so of the meeting was in German. And uh, so you can, probably can't see it, but there I am. On, this is my panel, and I've got on headsets. And you'll notice these other three gentlemen don't have on headsets. It's because they're speaking in German and listening in German. Okay, and uh, if you've never done that, uh, it's, um, it's mentally very taxing because you hear all this noise going on in the room, okay, and, but you've got to stay focused on what's coming in through the earphones the whole time. <clears throat> and then, uh, so I wrote a few things on cyber terrorism and testified on that, and that was just uh, one of the papers that I wrote on that. Okay, then I came to NPS, and uh, if you've never been to uh, Monterey in April, it, it's just exquisite. It's like the whole coast uh, along uh, Pacific Grove, it's actually a Pacific Grove coast, there are these pink, pink purplish flowers, and they're just thick, it's like a bed of these things. And uh, you've got to see it, it's just uh, amazing. And. Uh, so a lot of what I'm doing is uh, related to uh, terrorism. So in California, you can't, uh, can't track terrorists without a permit. So you got to get your permit to, uh, to do this. <laughs> uh, and this is, uh, I think it was probably the last slide. Uh, this is just kind of a summary of what I'm teaching. So, you know, so I went from teaching computer science to some things that kind of have have some overlap, but you know, this one here is really, you know, off the wall compared to what I was trained for. <laughs> and then uh, just some of the things I'm working with. And uh, this project down here, the one at the bottom, Jim Yule, I'm working on, Jim's actually does 99% of this. Um, but uh, it's been a, been, a, been a privilege working with you on it. Okay. And uh, I think I pretty much spent all my time, but I did get through it all. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> I think we'll take, what's, what's your schedule afterwards? I don't know. I don't know. Come in <laughs> with Christina. Oh, okay. Well, Christina's right here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, a, a few questions. I, um, if there are some. There have to be some. Chris. <laughs> What did you do here at Purdue that set you on the road to success that you're, that you're, that you're on? You know, I never thought about success. In fact, I was really worried about getting tenure. And so, um, so, I, so part of the reason why I did a lot of cooking. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and that was my backup plan. <clears throat> In fact, I even taught some cooking classes over at the Eight Mice. <laughs> they, they are no longer. Yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, I got a note from whoever it was that Joan Forth that ran that. And so, but um, so I, I felt very fortunate I got tenure. I feel very fortunate I've been successful, but I never tried to be successful. I mean, I just, I did try to get tenure, but um, 
<laughs> that was a battle, and for those of you, you know, many of you probably don't know this, but I was denied tenure the first time. And uh, part of the uh, issue was that I collaborated too much with this guy in the front, front row here. So, <clears throat> so we, didn't, uh, we didn't do too much together after that. I worked really hard. What about your students? I'm sorry? What about your students? Uh, my what students. Are what are my students doing? Your PhD students. Master. Well, I only had one PhD student. Uh, I had two at, at Purdue, and one was a woman who, um, I think she got married or something, and she left before her thesis, and she never finished her thesis. And, uh, you know, so I, I probably didn't do all I could have done to help her finish that thesis. And the other student was Matt Bishop. And any of you in security, you know Matt Bishop. <laughs> and so um, I'm very proud of that, except for that I, I didn't do much. I mean, that was Matt. Matt's just very good. Okay. Well, then, Doris, the, you were supposed to have a four. Well, well uh, if you really want to talk to Dorothy, uh, she'll have a little bit of time here. Okay, so just come on up. Okay, thanks again.